All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Exploring Science. Um, as you can see, I'm here in the lab. Um, and for those of you who have maybe seen me before, I do chemistry. And so I'm going to show you kind of a common thing that we do uh, in chemistry. Uh, and the purpose of this is sometimes there we want to do a chemical reaction without any oxygen around, without any extra um, gases. But the problem is that when you have a liquid, any liquid, you have a bunch of dissolved gases in there. So this technique is called freeze pump thaw, and it's to get any gases out of the liquid. All right. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started? So we're going to start by freezing, if you could guess, by freeze pump thaw. And to do that, we're going to use liquid nitrogen. Um, have any of you ever seen liquid nitrogen before or heard of it? It's nitrogen gas that's to a liquid and it's very, very cold. So just... Sandra has heard of liquid nitrogen before. Okay, nice. Can you guys hear that? Oh, Alicia also has too. Do you see it's all steaming? Does anyone have any idea how cold liquid nitrogen is? Any guesses on a temperature? I can't see the chat. So. Negative 200. That's a really good guess. Okay, yeah. Negative 100. Are you guys talking Fahrenheit or Celsius? Give us a unit. Or Kelvin. Or Kelvin. <laughs> Negative 150 Fahrenheit from Ethan. Alicia's talking in Kelvin. Okay. You can't go negative in Kelvin, but <laughs> all right. All right, yeah. So liquid nitrogen is 77 degrees Kelvin, which corresponds to about negative 200 degrees Celsius, which is negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. So very cold. So you don't want to put your finger in that <laughs> and instantly freeze, and that would not be good. So I'm going to be very careful with this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get my flask into the liquid. I'm just going to drink this. <laughs> Sorry, to get slow. There are foods with liquid nitrogen. Well, usually it's used to freeze the food. This is a good point. You guys see that boiling? It's so cold that it boils really fast at room temperature. Yeah, so this should freeze our liquid very rapidly. All right, we're just going to leave it there to freeze for a bit. Um, Some people are saying this is very fascinating, Claire. Okay, <laughs> good, good. Yeah, so, uh, so thinking about dissolved gases and liquids. Um, What's the room temperature currently? The room temperature? Uh, 25 degrees. Usually it's about 23 degrees Celsius-ish. Um, I don't know if you know what that is in Fahrenheit. 70. 70. Yeah, exactly. So it's much colder than that. Um, so yeah, often you don't think that there's a bunch of gases dissolved in liquid, but that's very true. Uh, I think for one, uh, that's how fish can breathe, right? There's a bunch of oxygen actually dissolved in the water. So that's how they get oxygen. And then uh, if anyone has ever boiled a pot of water, you see that the first things that happen is there's these little tiny bubbles that form and that's all the dissolved gases that are escaping. So you can think about this too with soda. There's a bunch of, they pack a bunch of extra carbon dioxide into the, into the soda. Claire, for people who are just joining us, can you give us a quick refresher on oh, what we're yeah. doing? Welcome to everyone who's just joining. I'm here in lab and I'm showing a common technique that chemists use to get a bunch of gases out of liquids and it's called freeze pump thaw. So we're currently in the freezing step and we have used liquid nitrogen, which is very cold. Um, we're just waiting to make sure it's really frozen all the way. Um, you can kind of see it steaming and boiling. All right. So anyone have any guesses as to what the second step is? Uh, we got some ums. Um, 
So we did the freeze. Do you remember what Claire said this is called? Yeah, there's three steps and it's in the name. It goes freeze, pump, thaw. So the second thing we're gonna do, so now we've frozen all of our liquid down there. And the next thing we're gonna do, there's still gas up in the top of this, um, of the flask right up here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a really strong vacuum and suck away all of that gas. And then what we'll do is we'll then thaw and now we've got like a vacuum space up there. So then it's gonna basically pull all of the gases from the liquid now into the into the top of the flask. All right. <laughs> so we've got, I think it's pretty much frozen now. So the next thing is to pump. And so chemists use often this very fancy piece of glassware up here. They're called a schlenk line. And there's two options. You can have nitrogen gas. Or you can have vacuum, and we use both of these for different things. So this one is currently hooked up to, to the vacuum, and I'll show you down here. We have a, a vacuum pump, hence the freeze pump saw, and this is going to pull a really strong vacuum. So that's much more powerful than your vacuum cleaners at home. All right, so I'm going to just go ahead and open this up to vacuum. Open that one, and then I'm going to open this one. So we pump it off. All right, and then it doesn't take too long. I'm going to close the glass up. All right, so now we've frozen and we've pumped, and now it is time to thaw. So I'm going to go ahead. And we're All right, so remember guys, now we have a solid frozen in the bottom and then like a vacuum empty. above it, empty space, yeah. All right, so I'm just gonna use just warm water. And if you look closely, you should be able to see some of the gases escaping. So let me know if you see any bubbles. Can you guys see any bubbles? Hmm. Might take a little while for it to start thawing. Yeah, we can see bubbles. Do you see how they're you know, they're coming out of the there's some bubbles every once in a while? Kind of small. See him going up? Very small, yeah. <laughs> For people who have just joined, what we're doing is a technique that we use in chemistry labs a lot to get all of the dissolved gases like oxygen or carbon dioxide or nitrogen out from inside of our liquid. All right. Yeah, I think part of what's happening here is we've got, because it's so cold, we have a bunch of ice. <laughs> You can see, so now this liquid in there has a lot less gas in it than it did before. Awesome. All right. And then to do this in the chemistry lab, you would want to do that a couple times over and over to really make sure that all of the gases are out of there. Um, so, so sometimes you don't get it all out on the first try. So then I would repeat the freeze and thaw again, but I won't do that right now because it takes a little bit of time, as you can see. Gotta wait for it to freeze, wait for it to pump, and wait for it to thaw. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, we have a couple questions. All right. One question, we were talking a lot about different phase changes here, right? Can you explain what yeah. sublimation is? Oh yeah, sublimation is when you go directly from a solid to a gas. So that's something that 
might be happening a little bit here, right? So we have frozen our solid and then we're pulling a vacuum. And sometimes we can have things going directly to gas from solid. Yeah. Um, and you can see that if you've ever uh, seen dry ice before, you can see the solid that's frozen carbon dioxide. It goes directly from the solid to the gas. Very cool. Okay. One more thing. What happens if we touch liquid nitrogen? You would get very bad frostbite and your finger would probably turn black and fall off. All right. <laughs> Lesson learned. Do not yeah. touch it. If a little bit gets on you, actually nitrogen evaporates very quickly. So it it isn't the worst, but you just want to be careful. So anyways, yeah. do we want to get stuff yeah. out? All right. Ready, guys? All right. You see that nice cloud? All right, I hope that was enjoyable. <laughs> We're gonna hand it over now to Kartika um, to go through some rules. Hope you enjoyed your time Thanks, in our chem lab. <laughs> Today's exploration, we have Dr. Valentina Greco. Um, she is a professor in genetics and she's gonna talk to you about using microscopy to study, to study my skin. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to her. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you all. And I guess um, I would like to start by seeing in the chat um, what you think when you think about science. What is it to you? Anybody? Is it everything? Is cutting a frog open? I love that exploration and discovery. Yeah, the curiosity and the experiment. I, I think we are all born scientists too, um, in the sense that we are curious to understand how we work, what we are surrounded by exploring. So when I, I was preparing this presentation, um, what I was thinking about is that science to me is an opportunity to have a leap into the unknown, the exploration that was in the chat, to discover is something for which we don't have yet an answer. Now this can feel very unsettling and actually scary to me. So I draw courage from two things. One is um, people. Um, and one person that I wanted to bring to you is someone that has shaped me tremendously is the mentor that I had for my PhD studies, Susanito, who unfortunately is not with us anymore. She taught me how to think about nature by embracing every single thing I would observe. And she has created a, an incredible legacy um, where her own lab members are standing strong two years after her passing and they are doing incredible science on their own, showing the importance of doing science in groups. And the other is my passion of thinking about the dynamic aspect of regeneration. What you're seeing here on the right is what makes my heart pump every single day, the opportunity to look live at the cells in our skin, in our tissues. You're seeing actually how a hair follicle looks inside your head. If you touch your hair, the outside part is supported by a strong collection of cells and here you're seeing all these round things are cells um, that are contributing together in creating the hair that will grow out of your body. So the ability to watch things moving and dynamics is what makes me excited. Looks like a jellyfish, right? And so in thinking about that, um, what my lab decided, is the, the, what I wanted to do with respect to my scientific path and my personal path, I feel like they're quite intertwined. So I wanted to walk you through what, um, how I came here to the United States. Um, and so if you look at the world in its entirety, um, I come from uh, the south of Italy and specifically from a city called Palermo, which is the capital of Sicily. Um, and these are my mom and dad who, have always instilled in me um, the opportunity of using work as a way to contribute to society and a way to create an opportunity of growth for myself. However, in Sicily, I was very limited in my ability to study. For instance, I applied for a PhD program and I didn't manage to come in. And so because I wasn't accepted, I had to uh, kind of find a plan B. And my plan B was to apply somewhere else. And so I ended up applying in Germany um, from Italy um, and there I was uh, given the opportunity to do a PhD. And I remember when I applied there and I uh, spoke with scientists like Suzanne, for instance, I remember during the interview, uh, a very deep sense of emotion, crying actually during the interview, because I was shown movies and science that felt the science fiction for me, because I was coming from a place where there was an opportunity to do science at that level. 
in that place, I also met a, a dear friend who then became also my husband and with whom we decided to venture from Germany to United States for uh, our next step of the training during our postdoc. And so we landed uh, in New York City in the United States where I trained with uh, a different uh, scientist. And uh, in New York, what I learned is a different way to think about science. But one thing that was really dear to me in my path is that at that point, science wasn't going very well. And actually, um, the things were going pretty badly. In a way, I was even labeled as a loser. And I don't know how I got out of that. And I managed later on, just a few years later, to be accepted to run my own lab in New Haven here at Yale and hired by these two gentlemen. Um, and that was really a, a marking experience for me because often in our path, we feel like a failure, we confront failure, and yet um, we can continue to work on the path to think what else is left for us to, in our lives. And when I joined Yale, it wasn't only to these two gentlemen, but there was actually a large group of people that created an environment for me to grow as a human being and as a scientist. And so what I'm gonna tell you today is just a, a brief vignette on the science that we do in our lab. And the goals for today is thinking about our largest organ that we are um, encompassed by, our skin, um, thinking about um, the cells and microscopy, which in my opinion are the most fascinating things because I think about cells as I think about people and how they move around in the context of system and organization, like cells move in the context of tissue. And then I'm um, thinking about the power of ourselves and how I'm going to show you they have a much larger healing power than I had anticipated. And so we use the skin because it's really the most external organ where we can use microscopy and so use this powerful magnifying lens to understand how um, our tissue and cells are organized. And this is a cartoon you might see on the web where schematic here represent uh, the surface, what you touch when you touch your skin, which is called epidermis, and then deep down the hair follicle that somebody parallel to the jellyfish. And so these two systems are very powerful for us to ask questions and especially to set up a microscopy. And I'll show you how my students have done that in my lab. So here we are back at the jellyfish. Um, then now you have more of a sense of how we can take these mice, just gently and exercise them and look at them and just marvel at uh, all the behaviors of these cells. We can see some cells splitting, some cells moving. And what fascinates us is how they do that very harmoniously. So let me tell you a bit the subject of today. Um, the subject of today is something that uh, I find fascinating. If you look at your skin, you might not know that you are full of mutation. And what does it mean? So look at the, this diagram. It's a very simplified version of a tissue where each cell um, is these squares that are white. When a scientist has started to look at this cell and look inside the, the DNA and starting to read all the letters in the DNA, they realize that many of our cells carry modification in the DNA, which is called mutation. And mutation is what doctors tell us that usually is a cause for disease. And many of these mutations actually that we are full of um, are associated in this case, for instance, with cancer. This is not true only for skin because we are told to be watching of the some time of the sun that we receive, but it's true also internal organ, like your throat, your blood. So it poses a very interesting question. Why is it that with all these mutations we have that we don't develop cancer more often than actually we do? And so uh, we wanted to ask this question and we started to think about, can we go and modify the cells and the DNA and uh, include this mutation? And why this mutation in this case is called WINT um, and it's something that I would like for you to think about in uh, your breakout room or what you think this mutation WINT may be doing. And to give you some clues, I'm gonna allow you to see these two movies. In one case, 
um, a movie will be the movie of mutant cells and the other will be the wild type cells. So Lam, shall I turn it to facilitators? Yes. Yep. So everybody, you should be getting an invitation to join a breakout room with two awesome volunteers. Uh, feel free to turn your videos on, unmute yourselves, and talk about these awesome videos. And which one do you think is the mute? And which one do you think is the normal one? Sounds great. So yeah, so the, I, I had a blast in the breakout room. Um, and uh, we had the discussion about how to identify who is mutant, who is wild type. And I thought the comments were extremely perceptive. Um, some people picked up uh, on having more division on the left versus the right. And that was a clue for being the mutant on the left and the wild type on the right. But other people picked up on how the left one, the cells divide perfectly healthy. I thought that was a great observation because it teaches us that even with mutation, we can do certain processes like these processes of divisions in a healthy manner. And so in my room, the students were able to predict that too much mutation, too much uh, divisions may actually not be good and may lead to something bad. So um, if we continue to go on, I can tell you that in fact, prior work, when they were looking at this mutation and this wind and, and without having done movies, but what they saw is that when they put, um, when they look at the mouse that is absolutely healthy and they look at the skin by taking a section of it and then looking in a microscope, if the skin looks healthy through these follicles that look like these parallel lines, when instead that, that mutation that I show you was inserted into the skin epithelium, which is what you touch when you touch your skin, what they saw it will lead to skin tumors. And in fact, in my breakout room, they were predicting that with too much divisions, you will get that. So why is this relevant to us? Because in my lab, we wanted to start to study and understand how tissue interact with this mutation. So what we have to do is to now ask if we were to track the same cells in the same lab mice, like a student has shown you that we're using it on the microscope, uh, what we understand about the cells that divide too much. And so at day zero, what you're seeing is a very large fields of view and each individual uh, round uh, uh, structure you see is the nuclei of these cells and all together they form on this very nice architecture, which is uh, the architecture of the hair follicle inside your skin. And you might appreciate that they have this stylized type of organization that looks like an arrow pointing down. When we induce this mutation that I show you uh, lead to too many divisions, then we form this growth. And in my room, they've been predicting that these are aberration that happens within uh, the skin when you have this mutation. Now, my question to you is, um, what do you think happens next? If we were to follow the same cells and the same tissue, can you put in the chat, what do you predict happens to this tissue over time? It falls, yeah. Mm -hmm. Get worse, it will wrinkle up and die, it divides, dries, it dies, makes tumors, it will be unhealthy, wrinkle and die, wrinkle. So we are all feeling very negative about it, right? Mostly when you see those growth, what do you think? It's gonna get worse if a moss it gets, um, it gets to die or dries out. Well, when uh, my students kept following this tissue, they saw this. Can you compare these time points here on the right to the first one? To me, it looks strikingly very similar. They are similar. And in fact, when we reconstruct it, you look at these arrows, alias this follicle, and they are actually pretty normal. And when we look at them and we ask them how they function, they are normal too. They continue to make hair. That was pretty incredible because what uh, my students have discovered is that there is an ability for our tissue to be able to heal. So there, here there are cells that have a mutation that have transformed through all this division and make growth. And here the skin is capable of eliminating it and correcting it. So if you were to think about that, how do you think this happens, if you can put it into the chat, to the mutant cells that you have seen dividing a lot? To 
too much cells might cause cancer. We don't want that. They can build up and cause tumors. How is that? And <laughs> So you have seen that the tissue actually went back to normal. So if that is the case, what do you think uh, may happen to the cells? The disease can spread, that's true. But we have seen that actually the disease went away. The tissue went back to normal. More division, it is possible. Maybe they will be rejected by the body. Uh -huh. I think fetal cells spread across the body infecting the person and they cause cancer. The mouse will get skin cancer. So the cool news about actually this work is that actually the mutant cells didn't spread, didn't make cancer, um, and in fact, they were eliminated by the tissue. And the wild type cells, so the cells that were normal and they were healthy, were the cells that managed to contain the mutant cells. And so let me tell you what I told you, and let me tell you where we are going with that, and then we can just brainstorm with any question you might have. The way we think about what's happening in our tissue, um, and that relate to that even in my mood and in many other aspects of our uh, life, is that our tissue needs to have a sort of a steady state, like a rheostat that keeps readjusting around a certain uh, flat line. And this flat line needs to uh, always adjust between too much expansion, like for instance, too many divisions of the cells versus too much contraction or elimination of these cells. And what you have seen um, from those data, from those movies that I showed you, is that the tissue can even expand so much that it looks like it has cancer, and yet it can go back in and become again normal and oscillate around the normal steady state. That was really incredible for us because unless we use microscopy, we could not have understood that healthy skin cells can act as sentinels and eliminate uh, mutant cells. And so as a way to look at the future and tell you what we are excited as a lab to look at and always using microscopy is we like to think about the next set of question or opportunity that we have. Um, and what you're seeing here on the left is the last slide is a schematic that goes through all the way from the top of our skin all the way inside. And in the schematic you're seeing uh, in white the cells that I told you about which are called epithelia, and there are interspersed with immune cells. These immune cells allow you to detect pathogens, to detect bacteria. And then just underneath, you have all these color other elements, which are collagen. It's the same product you see in cream for the skin, as well as the vasculature in red, cells called fibroblasts all the way to the muscle. So if you now follow the arrow and you look on the right, you're seeing all matching colors, how we can go all the way from the top of the surface where the cells that you touch when you touch your skin are these white cells interspersed with red and green cells, which are the immune cells. And now this vasculature, it looks like all this network in red is allowing for the skin to get oxygen and nutrients and allowing with the, to get all the way to the muscle. It's a large playground for us to look at all these different cell types. The way we think about them is like different functional groups in an institution when we were trying to understand how, for instance, professor together with student, together with janitor, professional come together in order for us to function properly, say in an institution like Yale, and make scientific discoveries. And with that, I'd like to just to, to leave you with a picture of people that I'm forever grateful for. They feed me every day with their own ideas and their excitement about science. And, and together we have um, generated all the data that I've shown to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Greco, for such an amazing um, talk. Um, the students in the chat are very excited about, about your work and have learned a lot. Um, and we actually have um, a couple questions that we've collected over the event. Um, and the first question being, um, some students were still confused about whether or not the skin got better. So did the skin get better or not? It did, and that's why I think it's normal to get confused because we were confused too. We thought that this growth, and we, we thought that this might have to get cancer, but it turns out they did get to these tumors, but they were capable of eliminating them. See, in my field, we always stop at the point of getting the tumors. We take the mice, we analyze them, and we say, gosh, they got tumors, but we never look at them over time to ask what's happened next. 
And that's how we bump into this amazing discovery that otherwise we would have ignored because we couldn't predict that that would happen. And so a sort of related question, um, in the breakout room activity, was this the um, exact experiment that was happening? So um, was it the um, video on the left that was the mutant that got cancer and then got better? Can you explain that a little bit? That's right. So uh, what we were doing is asking prior to seeing this growth, can we understand what's going wrong? And so one of the characterization, let's say the consequence of that mutation is the cells split more. And in my uh, breakout room, they were saying splitting more keeps the tissue healthy, but maybe if not controlled can lead to growth. And they were right. It has led to growth. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, we just got another question in the chat, wondering whether or not you can use your research to explore how mutant cell, how mutant, um, how mutant cells create cancer or other diseases in the human body. So, how does this relate to um, human disease? It's a beautiful question, and uh, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. I love colors, and I love uh, uh, using mice because you can mark all these different cells in different colors and ask them how they come together. In human, even if I were to put my arm under the microscope, I would see nothing. So until I can safely label myself, uh, it would be not as interesting as the movies you have seen. I see. Um, and speaking about looking at my skin, um, there were some questions about the um, graphic you were showing, and they wanted to know whether or not that was the actual color of um, that you were seeing, or was it infrared or some other sort of imaging technique? And how, how does that imaging technique work? Like, how do you get the colors? Yeah, it's a beautiful question. Um, actually, the color are false color. We uh, 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 essentially assign that color. You could choose cyan, magenta, red. So what you see is a signal um, that is mostly white on black that allows you to detect the different structure. And then you can assign the color that you like the most. I see, so it's kind of like part science, part art. So you have people in there coloring afterwards. That's right. So if you guys like art, there's a, another project there for you. Um, another question we just got in the chat is, why are there mutant cells? Where did they originate from? Um, how did they get into the mice in the first place? That's a wonderful question. So in the case of mice, we have uh, approaches that have been developed for many decades, some of which have even given Nobel prizes for it, that you can go in and modify the genome of the, of the cells. And you do that in ways that um, you do it in the eggs of the lung, and then it can be inherited into all the progeny. Um, there are also much less invasive approaches now that can be used for modifying them. So that's cool. So basically, you can give one mouse um, a mutation, and all their children will also be mutated. That's right. You can program it as to be in, uh, have it in all the uh, children, or you can make it that only that mouse has it, and it doesn't pass it on. Interestingly, in our skin, we generate mutation by a number of different things, including exposure to sun and um, many other mechanisms by which we can naturally evolve the mutation in our body. But this mutation, we coexist. They seem not to do too much harm. I see. So there were a couple other questions that came up during the explanation, one being like, um, so in introducing this mutation, are you basically inflicting cancer on the mice, or is it there just a chance that they'll develop cancer? And also, um, whether or not um, it's genetic, I think the I think the question that they're asking is like, is like I guess being able to get cancer genetic, um, or is it just a mutation that's genetic and the cancer comes later? Yeah, maybe I can expand on this question by saying that we can get mutation both while we live as an adult, as well as we can uh, um, get it from our uh, parent, and so. Uh, both of them will be genetic because they go into the DNA and they make some changes that then we can continue to perpetuate that mutation as we continue to grow older. Um, is that the question, Yandra, or did I miss something? I think that was I think that was basically the question, um, the second part. But the first one I think is is the mutation giving the mice cancer? Oh yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. that's a very important 
part, and I would love to um, for you to know that we really take the health of the mice at heart. At the same time, you are right, we give this mutation to study how cancer arises. It turns out we are very lucky. These mice don't die. In fact, they cure cancer and they allow us to discover that. But in the first place, we're trying to understand how cancer emerges in order for us to translate some of these principles to also human health. Now, all of this happens under the, the supervision of a committee that uh, is a champion for any animals we use in labs as to inflict the least amount of pain um, and in a way that is good, um, respectful. Yeah, so they make sure that the mice are living the best possible lives they can. And those mice are, those mice are very brave in helping us learn a lot about science. So um, they're part of the research team. That's right. Um, another question we got in the chat was, do you know what chemotherapy does to those cancer mutant cells? Does it kill the cancer cells? What is it actually doing? I, I love this question, uh, uh, Alicia, and I'll tell you why. Um, chemotherapy kills everyone, not only the mutant cells, but also the wild type cells. And what we have understood with these results is actually the healthy cells are important to kick out of the mutant cells. So it's starting to make us think when we think about chemotherapy, are we maybe approaching the wrong way? Because we don't wanna kill the healthy cells because not only we want healthy cells, but they are part of the solution. So it's making us think of whether or not we should have a different approaches, maybe give more proliferation cues. This is really drastic and erratic, but as a way to think about how do we maintain our tissue healthy, also in the face of cancer, because the healthy cells are part of the solution. Yeah, so chemotherapy does not discriminate. It will attack both healthy cells and sick cells. So um, maybe your research can help um, figure out how to um, just target the um, sick cells someday. I love how Malak is giving a shout out to those brave mice. Completely agree with that. Yes, shout out to those brave mice. Um, a question we got earlier um, was, what would it look like if one of our cells mutated? Would, would you be able to notice? Like, what if one of my skin cells just mutated right now? Um, what does yeah. that look like? Yeah, so Riti, you remember the movies? We were seeing them splitting, and some people were capable of seeing also how they split and what shape they have. Imagine to freeze a, a snapshot and see that snapshot, you would be able to see which cells have just divided. You could imagine to do the same approach, you take a skin biopsy, and while you might not be able to watch them in a movie, you could ask how many divisions am I seeing? And that might be a approximation to how healthy it is, but there are markers, they're called markers uh, that you can um, color for and ask whether the tissue is healthy versus mutated. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have another question from Man in the in the chat. He was wondering if you have cancer and you got it from your parents and it dies, do you still give it to your kids or not? Uh, it's a beautiful question. How much it can be transmitted down versus not? I'm not an expert, but there are those some mutations that are known, for instance, BRCA1 and 2 are mutations that are known to be um, transmitted from parents to children that increase incidence, for instance, for breast cancer or other type of cancer. So there are some mutations that have been mapped. Um, also for colon cancer, there is a mutation in a gene very similar to the one I show you today. They will predispose to have a lot of more tumors. Uh, for instance, my mother uh, has it, and so I get checked uh, um, frequently with the methodology that now allow you to prevent colon, uh, colon cancer. So there are some genes that we know of, but many other genes interact with uh, a lot of more forces. Uh, your, how healthy you eat, if you are in an environment that is stressful, um, if uh, you know access to um, primary um, resources is not adequate, all this can interfere with our genetics and I think predispose us more to disease than not. But again, I'm not an expert in the subject. Right. Um, but thank you for for that answer. So there's still a chance, um, but you know we're still learning about. Um, so we have another question from Amelia in the chat. Um, so uh, we were looking at the skin cells of these mice, um, but what type of healthy cells does um, this attack besides the hair? Uh, yeah. So 
um, the hair are in continuum with many other structures. There are glands that, for instance, uh, secrete tubules in the in the mice, and they are used to, to create the oil and then lubricate the hair. There are cells that are just in this flat surface called epidermis. So the healthy cells are actually everywhere in this epithelium. And in the um, mice and also in humans, we have also sweat glands that are also made by these epithelial cells. And so together, there are the surface of your body that contribute to, to the healthy aspects of your uh, function. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Professor Greco, for such a wonderful um, presentation and also for answering all of our questions. And I will now pass it on to another volunteer uh, to close out the event.